All right. So again, my my thought with what we're doing right now is just to go back and give you guys a, a, a look at a condensed view of some of the things that we think are the most important from Advantage and actually have enough things uh, that or we can't count, which as uh, CPAs, we will say that it's, uh, it's enough things uh, that we have more than 10 uh, to go down. So bear with us, we'll go through this. And my thought here, of course, was that we would jump into this with some sort of grand sports center style theme and do a top 10 plays of the two days uh that we have here with this so of course with apologies to the sports center i had to grab that particular uh intro so enough of the corny schmoozing let's get to the first of our items uh this one i believe is whoops is jim norton so jim if you want to talk about this one thanks so this is my favorite module, no surprise to most people that know me, dynamic allocation. And one of the big things that happened in dynamic allocation that they touched on in Advantage, uh, I should say I touched on because I did the Advantage presentation on it, is the capability to do cross entity and cross currency in dynamic allocation. So for those of you who have worked with the module before or have the module already, you know that previously, dynamic allocations could not generate entries if they were going to trigger an inter-entity transaction. Well, in release three of 2020, they released the capability for those journal entries to automatically create an intercompany transaction. So if you have things like shared overhead in a corporate entity that needs to be spread out to all of your other entities and have a, a fair share of due to, due from, Dynamic allocations can handle that now. It can look across the entities and it can give every entity their fair share and automatically record the due to and due from. And it can do that regardless of whether the entities in the mix are all using the same base currency. So this is just one piece of really powerful functionality that they have brought into dynamic allocations. They're going to continue to make developments in this module it's, it's a really quickly growing and ever more popular module by the day but this one enhancement has is a huge impact for organizations that have more than one entity which is most organizations that work on intact so that's my update thank you all right thank you jim <clears throat> and i will add uh, to this uh, dynamic allocations is one is probably the most popular of the quote unquote newer modules uh, that they came out with a little while back. So dynamic allocations, interactive custom report writer, uh, a couple others. Dynamic allocation has been the one that's been the most well received uh, and it is coming up more and more in demonstrations uh, with prospects and so forth. So if you guys have a need for it, please let us know. Uh, promise not to be pushy or anything like that, but definitely we'll let you know the features and functions that are available with the dynamic allocations module. So, all right, let's take a look at the next one. All right, I believe, Kristen, this one is yours. It is, perfect, thanks, Philip. Um, all right, so this uh, particular slide, something that I found uh, kind of interesting, uh, it'll be new, I guess, coming out in release Four, um, that there's a new custom report on the inner entity transaction object. So if anyone currently uses uh, that particular object in a custom report, uh, they're now going to see that there's information uh, regarding the source GL ent entry. So different attributes for that particular entry, and that's kind of what I bolded or highlighted throughout the slide here. Um, previously, that was not included. It was only attributes uh, related to the inter-entity transaction itself. Um, so again, uh, in release four, this will come out. Uh, they did just specify that if you're currently using that object in a custom report, you'll notice in the screenshot there to the left, um, your, I guess, old object will say legacy uh, at the end of it there, um, and the new one will just be the inter-entity transaction. So, Still all of the same functionality in terms of getting in 
getting in there and uh, again, choosing your different attributes that you want to place on the report, you can group things, all of that is still gonna be the same. Just the idea that um, now there's gonna be information with uh, regarding the source GL entry there. Okay, great. It's good to see. Uh, and, and, you know, one thing to point out uh, here too is that the, in, in case you don't know uh, with it, which hopefully you do, Sage Intech does come out with four quarterly releases a year. So innovation like this at such a fast pace is one of the things that makes the Sage Intech solution um, so widely awarded uh, and, and makes it to where it is progressing so quickly with the advantage of the feature sets that it has. So that's good to see. And Kristen, don't go anywhere. I think this one is yours as well. Yeah, so in the next couple of slides that I'll review, um, I'll just kind of give some background. I'm, I'll say, newer to Intact, um, been working with Intact for about a year. So some of these things, um, you know, some of you may know or be very familiar with, uh, but I found them kind of useful, things that I kind of want to keep in my back pocket just, you know, in terms of getting used to the system and, and understanding how things work. So this particular slide talks about just managing cash receipts in Intact. Um, <clears throat> it just kind of goes over, you know, four different ways that you can manage or create or enter cash receipts within the system and then when or why you would do those certain, um, you know, those certain options. So whether that's you have uh, an invoice that you're going to receive a payment against, maybe it's an AR manual deposit, it could be an other receipt uh, or even a journal entry. So as you can see, those are kind of the options across the top there of this little screenshot. And then down the side, it kind of explains, um, you know, when or why you would be using those. So do you have a receipt that you need coded to a customer? If yes, then, you know, here are your options. Uh, same thing with importing. Um, you know, for example, you cannot import AR manual deposits. So obviously that would not be an option if you're looking to import those uh, receipts. Um, can you receive payment into undeposited funds? Yes or no. Uh, AR manual deposits and journal entries, that's not an option. So again, just kind of, um, I thought this was a nice, uh, a nice little, you know, thing, again, to keep in, in your back pocket, just in case you're, you're wondering how to manage those cash receipts and, and sort of what they, what they mean, what these different options mean in Intact. All right. Wonderful, yeah, and that can get confusing uh, in some cases. Not not confusing, it can be something where you're kind of going, okay, which, which one is best for me to use uh, in these kinds of situations? So good, uh, good chart to have. And yeah, I think this one's yours too. Yeah, it is. So a couple of these, and they seem so simple, but um, a couple of tricks, I guess, or hidden tricks, the first one, the pop-up calculator. Uh, I guess, you know, to be honest, I've never actually used that, and um, I saw that during Advantage here and thought, wow, how, how did I miss that? How did I not know? So in case you guys are in my shoes, that is available. Um, if you just start to type in one of the amount fields, you know, you type, type in a number and a math equation, and it'll, it'll do that math for you. So kind of a cool little trick. Um, the other one that I, I really wasn't aware of necessarily is changing your default contact for AP bills. Um, so generally when someone is going through the process of paying bills, it's going to be that person's email address that is used uh, when notification gets sent. But you can actually set that to be someone else. You can have a default you know, email address that, that that comes from. And there's kind of a roundabout way to do it. So in the AP configuration, uh, there's an option for payment approval settings. And you may not even have that turned on because you may not, you may not have payment approvals. You may not be using it. So what you actually do is you turn that on and kind of pretend that you are gonna use it if it's not currently enabled. Um, and then you can go ahead and choose the contact or the email that you, you want these notifications to be sent from. After you choose that, you're actually gonna go deselect that, that functionality that you just enabled. You're gonna disable that 
and you say, you know, you go through the prompts and you say, yep, I want to clear all of those approvals out, and that's fine. It's still going to take and keep that person's email. So now when you go to pay bills, it doesn't necessarily, you know, the notification doesn't necessarily have to come from the person who's physically um, working through that process. It can, it'll come from whoever you, you specified there. So I thought that was kind of a neat one. And then the last one, um, you know, probably most people know this too, but, but just in case, uh, there is the ability to do inception to date reporting. Um, so when you're running reports and things, some people want to know, you know, since, since we started Intact or the start of the, the organization, they want to do some reporting based upon that. Um, and these generally during implementation are probably turned on, but if not, if you don't see that as an option, you can go to your system reporting periods and you can find there's an inception to current month and an inception to date and you have to activate those. So it's kind of a manual process to activate those if that was not done, you know, originally. So just kind of uh, some fun, I guess, hidden tricks that, that you may not be aware of. Okay. And I'll tell you too, I, I knew about the pop-up or know about the pop-up calculator, but I often forget it uh, when I'm in doing a transaction and will, you know, pull up the calculator on my computer or, or one that might be beside me and use that. So good reminder uh, that that's there and, and has a little bit of tape there too, so you can see sort of what you keyed. So that's a, that's a pretty neat little feature. Great. And then Kristen, I think this is your fourth and final, correct? It is, yep. And again, this is more of maybe a reminder to, you know, to individuals here, but um, for me, I, I don't use the shortcut keys a lot and just reviewing or seeing this slide again come up, it reminded me um, of some different ways that you can use shortcut keys. So I think some of them that I, I really wanna get, I guess, back into using is like the current date, just typing a T, um, to get the current date in there. Uh, as you can see there, I, you know, I have them all listed. But the other one that I was, I guess, not even necessarily aware of is what I have highlighted in the bottom right-hand corner where it talks about if you're on a line item, um, you know, in a transaction, say an AP bill, you can actually hit the alt and down or up arrow to just um, stay within that, um, I guess, that field or that, that column and just go move up or down. So. I thought that was kind of handy too. And again, just more of a reminder in case people didn't know that these, these were options to use these uh, shortcut keys. Okay, great, great. And you know, I, I think these are good to see uh, on a regular basis. Um, again, I, I know about the T for example, for today's date, but probably more often than not would just type the date in. Uh, and not uh, not go back and take advantage of the, the shortcut key. So good to be reminded uh, and good to see those. So thank you. All right, I think we have next um, Andres. I believe this was yours, correct? Yes, thank you, Philip. So here we have two notable changes that are coming to the contracts module in R4. So the first one that I wanna to touch on are Billing for partial periods. So this used to be done in contracts using billing templates or having somebody manually edit the billing schedule. So now there's a small checkbox that when you're creating the contract line, you can select prorate partial months and it'll do all that math for you. So in the example that we have here, you can see that for on 115, it's not taking the full hundred dollars. It's only taken 5484. Um, so that's going to come up in R4. The next one I want to go over is the ability to configure a single revenue journal now for contracts. So now that ASC 606 has been adopted, um, you know, many customers may only need one revenue journal, so they don't want to enable both. Or you may have situations where you have both turned on and you no longer need your legacy revenue journals. So now when this comes out in R4, you can now hide this from your users. So when they're entering a new contract line, they only have to fill out the first one that you're actually going to use. Okay. Okay, great, great. Thank you for that, Andre. 
uh, contracts module is definitely growing in Sage Impact. Uh, it's it's one of the has been one of the sort of hot button topics. Uh, you know, SaaS companies, uh, anyone with subscription billing, uh, met with a few companies uh, as of late that were interested in it. So, great to see that module uh, continuing to grow, and uh, excited to see what's what's up for it next as well. So. All right, uh, Tabitha, I believe this was yours. Not mine. Not yours, okay, sorry. Whose was this one? If we're not sure, I can I can talk to it, Philip. <laughs> oh, it is Tim, okay. Philip. That's, that's mine. I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I included this because, um, you know, a lot of people know that we have four releases each year. Um, a lot of times they'll pop up, you'll have pop ups on your screen and maybe you don't pay a lot of attention to them. But as everybody's kind of alluded to, a lot of these changes come out with the releases. So it's really important that you pay attention to the releases that are coming out to see how they'll pertain to you. And there's three things that you can really look at when, after the releases happen each quarter. Um, you can check out the release notes from the home page, and then you can do a deeper dive in to those um, by module. So over here on the left, you'll see you can go into accounts payable, inventory, see whatever pertains to you. So that's one way you can do a deeper dive. But you can also look at the release videos, and you don't have to watch the whole video. What you can do is skip ahead to, like, if you want to see the credit card re reconciliation video, you can skip ahead to the demo. If you don't want to read the first part, you can see the outline and just go ahead and skip ahead. And then the next thing is a lot of times there's big releases that happen like this time with the credit card reconciliation. So when you're in the cash management and the credit card reconciliation screen, you'll see at the top every areas that you can access to tell you more about that feature as well with, with your in product announcements. And the final thing to always remember is to always check your permissions after every release because you don't automatically get the permissions to some of these things. So just remember the Monday after the release happens, go in, check your permissions to make sure that you have access to all the good information and all the new releases that happened. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you, Kim. Um, you know, again, it is uh, something where Sage Intact does produce a good number of, uh, of improvements each quarter and uh, it's always good to uh, go in and invest and, and take a look at those improvements and uh, what they can bring to your organization. So um, great highlights there. Uh, and they do they do produce a, a, a tremendous number of videos and release notes uh, with each uh, with each release. So uh, next we have uh, Dell. Stratton, uh, Dale has a couple of points he is going to talk about. All right, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, this is dashboard performance cards. So I got to thinking about this and something that I believe can be absolutely life changing for a lot of our clients with Intact is the dashboard. And I think that's something that a lot of clients skip over especially if they came from an older antiquated ERP system. They go into doing processes and transactions, reviewing reports, they look at a balance sheet and a P&L and that's all they ever look at because that's all they ever used to look at. But we have clients that dashboards have changed their lives in accounting software. So I've watched a, a, dash, a dashboard course, I attended that, and something that jumped out was a very simple piece of a dashboard as a performance card. And this slide shows the different types of account groups that you can make, and then you can use those account groups to display a performance card. So all a performance card really is, is just a box with a value. It compares that value to a prior period or to another value, and then gives you a positive green up arrow or a negative green down arrow. It can give you a thumbs up, thumbs down, smiley faces, frowning. Basically, it's just a visual indicator to say we're doing well, over not doing well. They're very easy to see and you can use account groups. You can use statistical account groups. Notice so they've got number of employees. So we're either up on employees or we're down on employees. And then a computation account group. So current ratio versus prior month. So net profit margin, 
uh, day sales outstanding, financial ratios. Those were the examples given. But performance cards are simple to set up and provide a lot of information at a glance. Now, the next slide is mine too, Philip, I believe. It, it is. I'll just say real quick, I, I love performance cards on dashboards. Um, I, I, as Dale said, they're quick, but I think they give you a lot of information just right at your fingertips. How am I doing versus last year versus budget, et cetera? Uh, just, I think they're very good to have. Uh, and I'll give an example. We have a client that in their previous accounting software, their, C, their CFO never logged in. They just asked for reports and looked at reporting information. And now that they can use dashboards, created several dashboards for them, put performance cards on there, CFO logs in, at a glance they can tell how the business is doing. Uh, this piece goes along with the performance card. So I see this happen quite often and, and have been at fault with it as well. So on your dashboard, if you allow filtering, at say you allow filter by the uh, date or by dimension, so you filter by department and the reports on your dashboard automatically update. If you have say a performance card that would be cash balance, and then you go filter by department office or department uh, sales, well, your cash balance or balance sheet accounts, so you may not have any sales transactions coded to that, so if you allow filtering on that performance card, then it's going to show up zero and show poorly. So just a very quick, easy tip is if you have dashboard filtering on and your performance cards always show up like junk when you do, go into that performance card and turn that dashboard filtering from allow to not allow. That will fix that for you. Okay. Great. Great. And Dale, I I think you've got one more, and I am on pins and needles to uh, to hear you talk about this one. So you guys will see as I move forward here. I am I'm ready for the explanation on this one. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you the uh, quick background on this. So my undergraduate degree is actually in business communications. So I used to do a little bit of training and things like that around how to do presentations and how to speak, and. I'll be honest, at the end of my second virtual conference in two weeks, this was the very last thing they did. You're, you're a little bit virtual conference fatigued, if you know what I mean. And I thought, how are they ever going to have something that makes me not want to just go ahead and close my browser window, especially at 5 o'clock Eastern time? And then they had, and I, I'm going to butcher his name, and I apologize, it's Vin Jane. And he comes out and he is a comedian slash magician slash speaker slash teacher and it was fun enough that I'm sitting here watching this and obviously in my dining room at home and it's after five o'clock and my wife's wanting me to do something else and I'm going, hang on, I'm trying to watch this and she said, what, learn how to do card tricks? So he uses magic as an example of it, it's just a problem that you can't solve, so it intrigues you. And he used the example of perspective, and I believe that's what he's doing here is he's talking about different perspectives on how to solve problems, and then he goes into speaking and gives very good examples and shows how if you speak at a monotone voice and no one wants to listen to you, and then how to actually change that about the way you present yourself and the way you deliver yourself. So I found it very interesting and actually kept me for an entire hour after five o'clock at the end of a conference. So that's saying something. Wow, that, yeah, that is, that is saying something. Yeah, and, and that's good. It's good non-traditional advice, I would say, right? How you carry yourself, the, the tone at which you provide the information with how engaging um, you can be uh, will uh, keep folks past five o'clock uh, is, is kind of the takeaway. And I actually thought we were going to learn how to uh, dance like Egyptians or, or something like that <laughs> with uh, with this one, Dale. So good advice, but a little disappointed. I thought we were going to see you dance. <laughs> no, no, not quite. I, I want people to keep keep watching your, your presentation, Philip. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. So we have uh, a couple here, and we'll bring on – whoops. 
Tabitha uh, Schmaltz to talk about these. Tabitha? Yeah, my slides aren't as pretty as everybody else's. I thought, <laughs> I thought you're going to fancy them up, Philip. Um, no, so it's okay. I just have a few things that uh, there are some improvements on that you may or may not have noticed if you work with reports and you're running them often. Um, these might be exciting to you. Uh, the first is some improvements that they're making with reporting, uh, where we now are going to have um, dimension balance reports that are available to us. So a lot of times we run, uh, we wanted to see what the balance was in an account. Um, so we run our general ledger, uh, but it's hard to tell which pieces go to which dimensions. Um, so we actually have the ability to do this either in a cascaded view or in a side-by-side -side view. And you can do this for any of your GL accounts. So the example here with the screenshot, uh, we just have like um, Department 100 and we have it split out to see which, um, these are all uh, like salaries and, and ins uh, insurance, which of these accounts have for opening balances and period balances and then your ending balances um, as opposed for each department or location or class, you could do this for any of your dimensions. Uh, the screenshot down below, we look at this as um, in a more of a side-by-side -side view as opposed to the cascaded. So this is where we could see all of our department 100, the site in each of the accounts. Um, so if you have a need to export this, one of the formats might work better for you. Uh, but just a really cool um, extension of how we can get additional information um, out of Intact. Okay, so uh, two, well, one point and one question for you. Uh, question, is, is this currently in the software now or is this upcoming? I believe it's in R4, uh, which is just right around the corner. Um, okay. And someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's R4. Okay, because that does look pretty handy uh, to, uh, to have. I've, I've run into situations with folks that wanted things like that before. And um, then mm -hmm. just to just to address, I, I looked at it, <clears throat> Tamsin, and then I just I really thought that your information was just so valuable <laughs> that really having any kind of formatting on it would really just take away from it. So, Th thank you for being considerate, Philip. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so this is the second one. This actually is already currently in um, in effect right now, and they actually kind of snuck this one in a little bit. I think. Um, so we actually have the ability when you're creating reports inside of that financial report writer, underneath the report name, there's now two new boxes, one stating report type and the other stating report audience. Now, most of us might have them blank because we're not going to go through all of our existing reports and decide what we want to put in them. But if you have um, specific reports or specific audiences that you tend to cater to with those reports, this is a great way to start filtering your reports um, so that way you can can, let's just say your report type might be like all of your monthly reports. Maybe you have a monthly package and you don't necessarily package it all up to deliver, but you do want to keep those types of reports separate from your management reports or from some end of the year reports or maybe some specialized reports. Um, you can also change your report audience. So maybe you have reports specifically for your managers and some for your board and maybe some for um, investors. So you can go and have different audiences identified. Now, using that information on how we've uh, now tagged our reports, either by their type or by their audience, we can go into the report center and we are able to filter on the report center uh, for which reports we're looking for. So the report center is going to have all of your reports centralized. So these are not only your financial reports that we normally see under the general ledger tab, but this could also have your custom reports, any scheduled or memorized reports, and any personalized uh, favorites that you have. Um, they're all in one spot, but this allows you to quickly go and find the reports that you're looking for, whether you know them by name, by type, or by audience. Okay, great. And you, you have to love it when they sneak those features in there, so to speak. So that to me sounds really uh, helpful in being able to uh, pull reports together and, and keep them grouped in an efficient way. So um, you got to love it when they sneak those in. Yep. So thanks, Jonathan. No um, so I, whoops, I went too far. <clears throat> so I've got one. Uh, that I just really wanted to remind everyone about. It's something that you probably know is there, 
um, as, as do I. I've, I've known it's there uh, since 2011 when I started working with Sage Intact. But it's, it's something that on occasion, it just it comes up and slaps me in the face. And I may learn a new thing about it uh, uh, here or there. Um, and I think that it's a really, really good feature in the system that doesn't quite get enough usage or respect, however you want to uh, to show it, but it's user defined books, right? So the the when I first heard about this particular feature, my my thought was, okay, user defined books in Ron, what are you hiding? Where you know, why are you putting transactions in different books other than your gap books? It doesn't make sense. But um, yeah, I've had a number of use cases over the years where it really has made a good bit of sense. Uh, first and foremost would be tax adjustments, right? So you're going to have adjustments that you make for your tax return in a lot of cases. You can book those in a separate book. Um, you may have some regulatory reporting for an industry, uh, blue book reporting, uh, something like that, where you have to uh, go in and present numbers in a different format or in a different way, or uh, it could be any number of things where you're making adjustments in the system that aren't uh, GAP, uh, traditional GAP compliant. So a user-defined book is really a, just another set of transactions within your environment where they're, they're segregated from your standard day-to-day -day transactions. Again, a tax book. Uh, you may make adjustments for tax depreciation versus corporate depreciation. Uh, so you could put those adjustments in a tax book. And then when you're running your financials, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, you have an ability to show your main book, right, your gap book, uh, and uh, include or not include your, uh, your user-defined or your tax book, right? And you can put them in separate columns. You can put them in one column however you want to do it, but it's a way to segregate your transactions to give you a little bit more differentiation with what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and a deeper, you know, uh, additional level of reporting. So, so uh, again, I'm going to claim that we just had so much good stuff that we went past top 10 uh, like we thought we would, things that we wanted to share, things we wanted to bring to you to kind of recap advantage. Um, it's been an interesting year in 2020, and as, as Dale said, for, for some of us, and I'm sure for a lot of you, uh, this isn't our first virtual conference, <clears throat> including maybe even back-to-back -back, uh, virtual conferences. O October seems to be that season. So um, we hope you enjoyed this wrap-up. Um, I thank the team for being here, uh, Jim Norton, Kristen Lindsmeyer, um, Andres Chavez, Tabitha Schmaltz, Kim Denton, Dale Stratton, I uh, hope I didn't leave anybody out, uh, and myself, of course, um, and uh, Jimmy Patterson for putting all this together. So um, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time and I look forward to more events from us. And certainly if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.